Any other uh, reflections on that practice? Yes, please. <laughs> Um, that's so interesting hearing um, both of your responses, because I had like a slightly different reaction, actually, to the first remembrance. And that's the one that resonated with me the most. And actually, when you said that, I felt this immediate lightness. Hmm. I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> We're all going to die. And all the people you know and love are going to die. And people, everyone. That's a fact. You know, that's inarguable. And it actually brought up so much compassion. Mm. I just remembered the faces of people who I might have difficulty with. And then I realized, yes, they're people. They're going to die and they're going through a lot. Yeah. They're going through the exact same samsaric experience of um, birth, death, suffering and it mm. just made me feel so much compassion and lightness and then I could suddenly let that tension between me and these other people or person mm. go and then I could just feel just a well of compassion mm. because of that remembrance beautiful so thank you thank you yeah and I think you know that is one of the things these remembrances can inspire that deep compassion and clear seeing right um, that's wonderful. And it is so interesting. Again, facts. We know these facts. What do we do to relate with them in a way that can be like lightning, right? And we did uh, the Sangha, we did our Day of the Dead, Dia de los Muertos altar, right? That's one way of like relating to that reality, connecting to that reality. We can write it on a little post it note right? We could tattoo it on our forehead. Like there are a lot of ways. And yet, my God, do we forget, forget and forget and forget. Just very interesting. And I do, I do find it's, it can be, you know, starting with that one, it feels like, oh God, right out the gate. We're going. But for me, I, I also experience that sense of just dropping like, oh, and then the precious human life is like, oh, oh my God, I get this life. And then that, you know, recognizing that everything I do has an impact. It feels like a really nice progression. Um, and then, you know, that, that chasing, you know, chasing a feeling good and avoiding a feeling bad, just what an amazing waste of time. Um, and, and yet somewhat inevitable because we do, you know, we have hedonic creature comforts and not a problem to engage, but how do we not get like totally caught up in that cycle thinking it will be our source of lasting happiness? Yes, please. Um, I just had a lot of thoughts. I mean, one, the first one was just, I really appreciated Mace you bringing in the reality of like what's going on outside. And so it felt like, and, and it reminded me of the Dale de los Muertes so if we're trying to, trying to bring the presence in, but also the protective grace of you just sort of acknowledging that I really, it felt like it brought the practice home in a certain way. Mm. And when we were talking about the, um, the impermanence of life, I just have this experience every now and then where I've talked on a couple of occasions about we have this old dog and mm. he sort of is in bed with us sometimes and my hand is on his stomach and I can just sort of feel his breathing. And I'm just, it's, it's accompanied by a sense about like, oh my God, this is, he's going to die. But I have this moment of mm. feeling his breath and there's a kind of a, a sorrow and a kind of a compassion and a, a sort of a deep love that it kind of opens up mm. a preciousness. It sort of leads into the preciousness right. of life. Thing. Yeah. And then the other thing I wanted to raise was just, I, I think it's very helpful to be doing this practice in the context of the story that we're reading now, mm. because, you know, in the chapters that we have up to now, he's become sort of a master of, you know, beyond materiality and not beyond materiality yeah. and perception and yeah. not perception. And each time I'm thinking, that sounds great. What's missing from that? And each time, you know, people are saying, yeah, this is great. This is what we do. Come and stay with us. And and I keep thinking, oh, that, that, that sounds pretty good. 
I think I'd go for that, but, but that there's something sort of else. Yeah. And it felt like, I think, I don't know if it's one of the chapters we've read already or coming where there's a sense about we're not trying to escape life. Exactly. That we're trying to do something different. And so it felt like, so I just, I guess I would be interested, you know, maybe in the context of the story or just your free floating reflections about how this relates to that quest. Exactly. Of, um, yeah. I think you're onto it, you know, I mean, that's it, right. Is these other States, these other teachers that he sat with and the experiences there, they could, they got him up and out. Right. He was able to, while he was meditating, completely be free of our neur- of neuroses and clinging and any kind of aversion. And then he comes back to this human realm and all of the suffering around him. And not good enough, right? That's not actually liberation and freedom. That's a, you know, that's like a day pass, right? Like you have a little bit of freedom, but you're coming back and it doesn't help anyone else. And I think of, um, I can't remember, (laughs) some of you may be aware that uh, Shambhala publication publishes these little pocket size and there's like a pocket Pema Chodron I have with like every worn page and like hard times in my life. It's like in the back pocket and there's one beaut and it's all taken from her books. And this one beautiful passage, she says, you know, you can't just use this practice for yourself. You can't just make this cozy place because whenever you come back from your cozy place, there's still, you know, your alcoholic family member, your disgruntled coworker, you know, the world as it is like we just it's not an option. And because of interdependence, even if we can have that day pass, we're coming back into this world in which our suffering is deeply connected to one another. And that, again, going back to the first chapter is like the seeds of awakening for Siddhartha is inequality and injustice, recognizing that if there's injustice anywhere, there isn't actually freedom for anyone. And he sees it, of course, in the inequality of his time, but also in the corruption and exploitation of the higher classes. Um, So, yeah, just really... Such an inspiring story, even if it's just a story. It's a great story. Any other thoughts or comments? Yes, please. Okay. I feel like I'm on a talk show or like when the audience, when they pass from. <laughs> um, all right. So this, this may be a question about just meditation in general, cool. but in terms of like running away from discomfort. Mm. <clears throat> and so one of the things that I've been experimenting with and struggling with, you know, in some of my meditations is, you know, I, I do live with anxiety, trauma related anxiety. And sometimes when like I'm meditating, like, for example, I'll notice like, you know, like sort of painful anxiety related like discomfort in my chest or my Mm -hmm. heart will start to pound to race and just trying to figure out what to do with that because Mm -hmm. that is discomfort and so i the the part about the breathing up was was helpful for me because it kind of allowed me to allow it to be there and like kind of create space for something else to happen that was helpful yeah at the same time sometimes it becomes it feels like if i'm by not attending to it i can't really do anything else yeah or i don't know how to do anything else yeah. effectively in that practice so it's trying to understand and it's almost like you know is there like yeah do you do you understand what i'm trying to say like when do, when do i attend to it yeah. when do i let it be there such a great question well, can- what would you do if you attended to it? So let's say like you had free reign in the practice to attend to it. Like what would that look like or what would, what would be helpful or regulating? So for example, there's this one um, meditation that I used to listen to where he talks about controlling the breath in terms of like longer, slower, deeper, you know, and then he says the breath is meant to be soothing. Mm -hmm. So I thought that that is interesting because it's not just following the breath. It's actually like using the breath. Mm. 
And there are times where that is helpful. And at the same time, and other times what seems to be helpful is kind of trying to let go of control by following the breath. Yep. Like that is what is soothing. Yep. Because so much of the dis, um, regulation it has to do with this fear of or fear and, want, and wanting to control right and is it also a fear of doing it right probably yeah <laughs> yeah probably. yeah yeah because um such a great question um you very often have great questions so thank you and i'm sure you're not <clears throat> the only one with it and it is a it's a very good general meditation question like what do we do when um we could we could say for the kind of you know gross body like the physical and then maybe the more emotional or subtle body blockages like what how do we work with them do we in practice decide okay right now i'm just going to I'm going to let go of what the main instructions are and turn my attention towards that. Um, do we just try to follow along and ignore or avoid? Um, different teachers will give you different answers and, and even different trauma informed teachers and practices will give you different answers. And this is definitely going to be an unsatisfying answer for you, but I would say it's, it's really going to be what works for you. And I do think it's interesting to work with it as part of your practice. So, oh yeah, here's this thing. I don't want it to be here. It's coming to my practice. That could be an annoying thought or I don't, I don't know if I've shared with you all, but I've had like a song stuck in my head on 10 day retreat sometimes. And it's like, don't want it. You know, like, I'm like, not like, you know, like inappropriate, like gangster rap song in my, you know, like not like very fun to dance to not right for practice. Right. And it's like, the more you're like, mm, and like, what do you do? Do I just start singing it? Like, absolutely not. Absolutely not. So it's interesting to figure out like, what do we do with these in some ways, like difficulties in our practice, our physical, mental, emotional. Um, and I think sometimes, especially with anxiety related, because I, I won't make everybody raise their hands, but I bet everybody would raise their hands of experiencing this during practice at some point. Um, and I have found useful for me, especially, you know, after a, a difficult um, experience, finding that neutral place in the body. Um, so I don't know if you've heard that instruction before, but like an elbow or an ankle, an area where there's like a little bit or even hands are a little more sensational, but somewhere where you can kind of get a hit of like, oh, I know where that is in my body. I can kind of imagine being there and resting your attention there. It's almost like tapping out for a moment and then coming back to the practice. I have found, but again, it's totally would be um, important to check it out for your practice or for anyone's experience, then if you turn towards it, right, it, it might actually get stronger. Um, and also resisting it will make it, can make it stronger. But that could change day to day. So it could be that coming to the instructions of mindfulness of breathing, like that's what's really going to help me manage this kind of discomfort and distress. It could be that what I need to do is focus on a neutral place. Maybe I open my eyes hands in the belly <clears throat> and doing that for a while and coming back did the initial like shaking hands with what was here that like handshake practice did that help in the beginning at all like maybe the first time when we talked about it last week because i've been doing it at the beginning of my meditation and experimenting with it i i think that because like lately i've been doing that um have a lot of kindness meditation, and I think that I may need five minutes before I start that. Yes. To even just like shake hands with my body and then just try to come to some kind of relationship with what's going on that's going to allow me to, because if, I, if, if I'm not settled enough, then I don't, I don't know how much of a point there is of doing that. I completely agree. Uh, for the for our online friends, um, he's describing that 
in sitting down to do a meta practice, he's been trying to like shake hands uh, with what's in the body, you know, and what's in the body is usually what's in the mind and the heart. Cause like, what's the point of just like, kind of like almost like forcing yourself into a meta practice, but you're really actually, you know, attending to all these other aspects. And it's true. I do like a long preamble cause it's fun, but also like part of the long preamble is like getting you all here. And so there's a lot of ways to kind of ease into our practice, just like coming from our busy life and everything else we're doing, just sitting immediately. For me, that doesn't work. You know, I gotta like, you gotta kind of like for me <clears throat> and some like that easing in, and that could be like even easing in our practice. I like starting I practice with my eyes open a lot, but even like looking around, which is also one of these trauma informed strategies you hear a lot of like, I'm in the room and there's ceiling. And even if you know, and it's your room, but really orienting to your place and space. <clears throat> so I think it makes a lot of sense to figuring out again, what can help you ease in and what can help you kind of ease out when you end up touching a place that feels a little hard. Um, so that's such a great question. Let me know what's working and what you're trying, you know, and see how it goes. And, <clears throat> and again, it's really fun to work with this, like, do I think I'm doing it wrong? You know, and, and giving yourself permission like Siddhartha of like, I'm going to make this my practice. These are the instructions that are being given, but what I need is this. So I'm going to do that and I'm not doing it wrong. Well, it, it's kind of funny because some kind of, because you, you, you often say this is really, really hard. You know, this is some of the hardest stuff to do and yet it's the only way. And, and sometimes I kind of laugh a little bit because it is so challenging. To do that kind of work. And then I think, oh shoot, that means I'm doing it right. Like I can't just give up. <laughs> Good. Good. Yes. Don't give up. It is hard. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. It is. It's like that last piece of cake, you know, that you're like saving and you're like, I don't know. I just want to eat a little bite and save it for days. Like these, these next like pages and chapter are so beautiful. I'm, and there's gonna be a lot of reading because it is written in so beautifully. And some of you know, um, it is exactly a year, maybe three days ago that Thich Nhat Hanh passed on. So it's so sweet to be reading his words <clears throat> always, but reading them, especially right now. Um, so again, here he is, he is kind of it's really started to recognize that he himself can take the teachings and learn for them. And so uh, I'll read a little bit from last week because this I think is a good way to get us there. And he's, he abandoned the desire to escape the world of phenomena. And as he returned to himself, he found he was completely present to the world of phenomena. One breath, one bird song, one leaf, one ray of sunlight, any of these might serve as a subject of meditation. He began to see that the key to liberation lay in each breath, each step, each small pebble along the path. So again, instead of, you know, uprooting up and out into some really wonderful place of open spacious awareness, he's realizing that all the phenomena that we experience through all of our senses and the living world, that is supportive of our practice. The monk Gautama went from meditating on his feelings and from meditating on his feelings to his perceptions, including all the thoughts which arose and fell in his own mind. He saw the oneness of body and mind, that each and every cell of the body contained all the wisdom of the universe. He saw that he needed only to look deeply at a speck of dust to see the true face of the entire universe, that the speck of dust was itself the universe and it did not exist. And if it did not exist, the universe could not exist either. So beautiful. It is like poetry and the poetry it's, it's, it's metaphor, but it's really this, this reality that like everything is connected. And him seeing that just so clearly, right? That every single thing is connected. That one thing being pulled away and it wouldn't actually be the fullness of our present reality. <clears throat> and the monk 
went beyond the idea of a separate self, of Atman. And with a start, he realized he had long been dominated by a false view of Atman as expounded in the Vedas. In reality, all things were without a separate self. Non-self or anatman was the nature of all existence. This wasn't a term to describe a new entity. It was a thunderbolt that destroyed all wrong views. Taking hold of non-self, Siddhartha was like a general raising his sharp sword of insight on the battlefield of meditation practice. So this is like a very... This will be unpacked many times in this book, but like such an important insight he has. This is this thunderbolt of insight. And he says that this false view of being a separate self, this was expounded in the Vedas. And so this is really where we do see kind of a shift in some of the ancient spiritual practices in India of the time, which of course are still very alive today. And and then with this practice of... Um, really recognizing if we can recognize that even a, a single moat of dust contains the entire universe, how could we be separate from that universe? Like, how could there be this like island of me that was entirely made up of me and didn't have to do with anyone else? It's such an interesting one. And again, I love that it's he's thinking and he's meditating and it's that it's like with a start he realized he'd been dominated by a false view such a beautiful description of insight i'm curious have, have folks here had insights like that where all of a sudden the way that you've been seeing the world it just slightly shifts i see some smiles that's good and it is it's really like a thunderbolt and we think we'll never forget it, but we sometimes we forget it. Um, I need to remember again and hear this idea that anat, um, anatman was a term to describe not a new entity, but it was just this this um, the general raising his sharp sword on the insight on the battlefield of meditation practice. And he'll get into this a bit more, but <clears throat> again that what flowed from him from seeing the deepest interconnection was recognizing himself as part of that interconnection. And we really see that the key, um, he says in the, in the next page, he knew he held the wondrous key, the truth of in, interdependent non-self nature of all things. I think it's a, it's a complicated view. Um, at least the first 10 years, um, you're thinking about it, this non-self. So I'd like us to just take a moment. I know many of you have studied this and thought about this idea, but what does that mean? What are we talking about? This non-self view that he had this striking insight upon. Pop quiz time. Any thoughts, any way that you think about it that makes sense for you? Please. Uh, the way I think about it is that there's no solid self, It's uh, but it's a combination of uh, memories, causes, conditions, physical factors, emotional, mental, all of that. And so there's no self that I can pinpoint. And because of that, uh, it becomes easier to uh, look into the characteristics of self because then those also would not be solid. Yes. And um, so it just the whole thing dissolves and it's just easier. Yeah. So, <laughs> Beautifully said. Yeah. So this, you know, no solid self, right? And what gets so tricky about how, like we, we need an identity to move through the world, right? It'd be very confusing if I woke up and I was, you know, no one uh, in every exchange that I had throughout the day, it would be hard, but we get a little bit, you know, fixated on this idea of who we are and we don't want it to change. And we want it to be this idealized projected view of who we are. And we just grasp so tight to it and then end up spending so much energy trying to protect it trying to bolster it, right? So it's not that 
being a person is such a problem. It's getting that, that like stickiness to it. And this idea that it's just one way and that we can't change. I think there's maybe a, someone online, anyone have a good, I'm not, I have such a trouble with that word. I'm not man. Atman, no problem. I'm not mom. Um, I get tongue tied. I mean, Brendan is, I, I yeah. can go. I don't know if somebody else wants to go. Please. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I, I like, I like, um, that person's answer. Um, it, for me, it's like, there's a lot of ways to like break it down, you know, and kind of see through, kind of what we imagine our experience of being a person is versus like what it actually is, mm. which is, you know, we have this idea that like, we're like the executive of a, a person or a life. And yet we're just, our attention is to and fro. It's, uh, you know, yeah, we can take a kind of a zoomed out look at one moment, but the next moment we're embedded in an experience. and. And really just that, like, you just find yourself embedded in an experience and maybe you have a little bit of it, of perspective, but it's not as if you're living with perspective the whole time, you know, running the mm -hmm. ship of the Brendan. It, right. it just isn't that way. It's, 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 yeah, it's very sort of shifty and, and sort of concocted to make you believe in some ways, or it seems like it, you know, to, uh, to, you know, carry on and do the human things of life um yeah rather than like <laughs> some other some other uh experience of uh personhood so anyways thanks i love that yeah and i think what you know you're pointing out there um I like that idea of my, you know, steering my own little ship internally it makes you think of the movie Inside Out, you know, all these little beings inside of you kind of orchestrating your every move, um, how much it distorts our, our perception of reality to think of ourselves as some sort of truth. Like I am me and I see the world as it is right and how so much delusion gets there right so when we start to loosen the sense of who i am and what i do and what i like we have a lot more freedom yeah yeah and it's interesting because again you know the vedas which are incredibly beautiful spiritual teachings there's a self um and that's n not per se a problem but in terms of what Siddhartha was looking for, it just, it created too much separation, too much distance and difference between his consciousness and the entire consciousness or world um, out there. Yeah. Great work on the pop quiz. Any other like questions? It's like, it's, a, it's interesting too, because to, I don't know, Brendan, if you had that like, I am not an executive of myself as like a lightning bolt experience at one time, but. Um, I mean, it came, it's come a couple of times. I mean, there was one time in meditation early on where I was like, you know, if anything, I'm more all of the experiences I've have, I've had consciously than I am anything else. Like that is closer to like a me. And that one was like, I didn't understand why, like why that occurred to me in that moment, you know, I'm meditating and then yeah. all of a sudden it's like, well, this is just like a very, very true experientially. And then, yeah. And then other times like sort of different aspects of the, the no self thing, like kind of, yeah. The fact that like, you're just constantly, you know, your attention is shifting constantly all the time embedded in different experiences rather than some like executor. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, 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 please. So I guess Brendan's, what you were saying was kind of making me think about the, the true self then, if we're not actually a collection of, like, I'm hearing self is a collection of experiences or feelings or memories or that, you know, creates 
the self, but is that really the true self, right? I, I'm curious. So is the self beyond all of those things? Because all of those things are actually material images, thoughts, feelings, that, those are actually all materials. Mm. So I'm curious, it's an open question, what is the true self? Yeah. And I think that the true self is much more universal. Mm. Yeah, yeah. There is not a definitive answer. No evidence-based research on this, thank God. Don't ask GP chat. Um, sure, they have an answer. Um, but I really love Sokni Rinpoche. We read his book a couple of years back, Open Heart, Open Mind. Minja Rinpoche also talks about this, but the mere eye, M-E-R-E, -E, the mere eye. And that not true as in, you know, the maybe most metaphysical existential truth of who we are, but what is a sense of self that's really wholesome? And the mere eye is... Just the knowing and the feeling without a lot of the added um, fixation upon it. And so it's more than just sensory phenomena. It's more than just what I smell and what I see, right? There is concept and cognition, but it's not sticky. This mere eye, he's actually more recently, Sokni called it simple eye. Um, so, and that doesn't mean, you know, you're, unintelligent or um, unthoughtful. And it's interesting. I, I really noticed this. I was so fortunate to spend a little time with Minja Rinpoche this fall. And <laughs> it was like a, in an event where there was quite a lot of um, accomplished people. And it was notable, the softness of his presence. And it wasn't, and not like a, he wasn't like, I have something to say, like not this leaning forward, like ah, da, 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 me and my ideas. It was this very simple, but unbelievably penetratingly clear presence. And I, you know, when you think of like, what is a mere eye? Like that was made a big impression. You know, he said a couple things to me that I still think about in my practice every day, but it wasn't like, let me tell you, like what's the, it was so simple and he's done so much work um some of you may know he did a three-year wandering retreat where he let go of everything and just pursued the life of a you know a yogi on the street so he could really deepen his practice um and wow the book he wrote about it, I'm actually thinking might be interesting for us to read here. It has a lot of similarities, this kind of biographical aspect of what it's like to deepen your practice. And I think he really learned what it was to be a mere eye uh, in the context of that, of that wandering retreat. Um, okay, a little bit more. I'm so excited. I, we will have more left There's over. There's a question. Um, oh, yeah, sure. Diane had a question. Or a comment. I, or... I keep putting my hand up and my hand down. What everyone said has just so resonated with me. And and the, oh, this book is so wonderful. I read it a while back and that reading again. And it's so rich going forward too. And I just feel better about being impermanent sometimes because it, the flip side of that is it is what I call the big everything, right? Which happens mm -hmm. to be B-E. And that's the acronym. But, you know, I know I'm pretty clear that I'm, I'm not this, you know, five foot two thing. I'm aggregates. I'm composed of, of yeah. different elements, the earth, all the, you know, the five um, elements and right the <laughs> sensation and those five aggregate things. And it's all like no solidity. But when I, and so you could go, oh, all impermanent, you know, but, but then that, okay. So what is that for me? That really means there's ultimately we're all, we're all one, you know, the big everything, or I call it the hundred percent, you know, and I love that. That way, if we all live that way you know, things would be, there'd be no more capital riots. That's for sure. <laughs> wow. So beautiful. So forget I'm nothing. I'm everything. Yeah. Cause right. he was like, well, oh my God, I'm so fragile and it's yeah. impermanent. And, you know, but then it's like, wow, well then it's, we're all one, you know? And yeah. Thank you for saying that. I feel lifted in my heart to hear that. And that is that those are those, again, we can have those kind of experiential insights. Sometimes what someone says or what we read, give us those insights. 
Um, so it's just so nice to hear that turn of phrase for you. Um, yeah. Yeah. And making it really come alive. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'll give us, oh my gosh, out of time, but I'm still going to read just one paragraph here because it's so beautiful. Um, beneath the papala tree, the hermit Gautama focused all of his formidable powers of concentration to look deeply at his body. He saw that each cell of his body was like a drop of water in an endlessly flowing river of birth, existence, and death. And he could not find anything in the body that remained unchanged or could be said to contain a separate self. Intermingled with the river of his body was the river of feelings in which every feeling was a drop of water. These drops also jostled with one another in a process of birth, existence, and death. Some feelings were pleasant, some unpleasant, some neutral, but all of his feelings were impermanent. They appeared and disappeared like the cells of his body. It's so beautiful. I love this idea of the self as just this flowing river, always there, always moving, always changing. With that, let's dedicate our merit. We're just returning to this field, this flowing experience of being in a human body. Really remembering that the purpose of our time here together is, of course, to cultivate the heart and the mind, to do so in community, and ultimately to do so for the sake of all beings. And hoping that any effort we have generated here together tonight could be in service of that aspiration that all beings could be healthy and strong, that all beings could know a sense of safety and belonging, that all beings could be free. So we have couple announcements. Um, the first I'll say is that Chandra is going to teach online next week. And then I will be back the week after. And we'll do the happiness hour. Come an hour early. Bring a burrito, torta, or whatever. Um, and then Mace has some other announcements for us.